We are about to get it started with AP Live. I'm Kristen Brandt, and over the next eight lessons, myself and Ms. New Roth are going to lead you through a series of reviews and activities and diving into our skill set that really are going to help you prepare for that AP exam. So what is it we're going to actually learn? Okay. If you're also like my students, you really want to dive into content. Our job over these next eight lessons are really to figure out how all of these pieces fit together. We really want to dive into those skills that you need to have in order to find success on that AP exam. So how are we going to do that? Well, in this one, we're going to start to think like a geographer. We're going to dive into the big ideas of the course. So we're going to use content to really understand this material. So first, what we're going to do is identify the big ideas, and then we're going to look at those big ideas through content. And so you're not going to find eight sessions on just our eight different units of content. What you're going to find are these big ideas, skills, and assessments that weave the content into it. So you're going to have to be paying attention through these 45 minutes. I know you love to practice questions, so rest assured at the end of each one of our lessons, we're going to make sure we practice um, some multiple choice questions and some potential FRQs that should match what we, the content and the skills and the big ideas that we looked at throughout our time together. So let's dive right in. We've got three big ideas, and these big ideas kind of encompass every single unit that we're going to look at. So the first one, spatial patterns, organizations of human society are arranged according to political, historical, cultural, and economic factors. So what does that mean? What we want to do is, what do you see when we look at a map? What do we see when we look at an image? So we're going to look at some examples here in just a little bit. Big idea number two, these impacts and interactions. Complex relationships of cause and effect exist among people, their environments, historical historical and contemporary actions. Big key here is the cause and the effect. So what we're going to look at is kind of that cause and effect relationship and the connectivity between all of those things. And then finally, big idea three, spatial process and societal change. This allows for a focus on the ways phenomena are related to one another in particular places, which in turn allows for the examination of human organization and its environmental consequences. This is a lot of human environment interaction. Um, this is going to be a lot of us looking at the connections between people, the land, but it's also the cultural piece. Like how does where you live impact how you live and vice versa? The big question we continue to answer, look at this, our first practice question, it's the why of the where. And let's be honest, this drives so much of what we do in AP Human Geography. So when we look at the why of the where, what is it we're trying to really dive into? It's not just identifying, it's that explanation of the spatial pattern is crucial. We need to be able to explain the why of that where. So let's see what I mean by that when we dive into examples. See? Nifty little slide to transition us. So these first few slides are going to focus on big idea. Number one, the patterns in spatial organization. So if we're looking at rice production from 2018, what you want to be able to say is, what do you see? What trends do you see? Where do we see the majority of rice production? Then we want to ask our question, ourselves the why. Why there? So your teachers probably did a lot with um, environmental determinism or possibilism. And so we, then we could even dig in here and say, okay, if I'm looking at South Asia, I'm looking at East Asia, I'm looking at Southeast Asia, okay, the climate, that humid subtropical, warm, muggy, it's ideal for growing rice. Okay, but we know that sometimes the land isn't always suitable. So maybe we have to then make it possible, right? By terracing that land and making sure that we can use all available paper. Uh, plots of land. Let's take another look. So now we're in patterns of spatial organization. Again, what trends do you see? Here we're looking at cocoa bean production in 2018. Do you notice that we're looking really along throughout the tropics that are heaviest production, um, Southeast Asia, 
take a look at Brazil. So then the question here, when we see patterns and spatial organization, we should ask ourselves is how do the available resources influence how people grow food? So we might think about in cocoa production, sometimes these smaller farms, um, we might look at, might think about luxury crops. We might think about who they're selling the food to, that resource to. Um, I also like to look at those trends. Look at this. We're in the periphery, right? Go back to Wallerstein's model. We know that most of these are LDC countries. Um, and what we really look at is the then what, right? So we're right now, we're just looking at the trends. We're going to look at impacts and interactions later, but you can see why that pattern is important for us to note so we can start to explain, start to make those connections. In contrast, take a look at wheat production. What do you know that's notice that's different between the pattern of wheat production and the pattern of cocoa bean production? Did you notice that we're in temperate climate zones? Do you notice that we're looking at more nations in transitions or um, more developed countries? That we're looking at core countries? So we're looking for those patterns. And then the question later is going to be the then what? What's the impact? This is a staple crop as well. And so how does that impact development later on? This one's fun. I'm not going to lie. I had to spend some time looking at this. So feel free to pause at any time to really dive into this. This was the new one that, that came across this born in state of residence. And so why do geographers study relationships and patterns among and between places. So the very first thing that I'd want to do is understand what is the pattern that I see? What's the trend? Um, prior to this, I was talking to a friend and we were looking at, um, look at all these people in the Midwest. Why do you stay there? Um, because Midwest is awesome. It's where I live, but you have to deal with winters. Again, people in the Midwest are awesome. And then we were looking at Florida because I will tell you, all my students are constantly like, I move into Florida. Well, the trend would suggest, right, at 35% are people that were born there, that there are a ton of people that moved to that area. But I would just like to say is people don't want to leave the Midwest. Why is that? Well, let's dig into some vocabulary words that maybe your teachers or phrases that your teachers use, such as, um, how about sense of place? Okay, when I think of sense of place, there's meaning behind it. And so for me, while I live in Illinois, my sense of place, I grew up in Wisconsin, and that's always going to be home to me. It could be perception of place. You know, people perceive Florida or California as these wonderful places. I know they're wonderful. The sun is always shining. Places to live, but that's going to draw people. Your teachers probably also talked about things such as distance decay. And so, for example, I live in Illinois. My parents live in Wisconsin. My husband had an opportunity to work in another state, but it was going to take me further away from my parents. And I'll be honest, I knew that the interaction between uh, my parents and myself would decrease if we moved further away. Distance decay. The closer we are, the stronger the pull, the stronger the interaction. The further away, the less interaction. And so we know that there's things that have changed that. I mean, I can Zoom with you right now across the globe, but it's still, we know it's not the same as being together patterns. We also want to take a look at how do we sometimes um, look at those patterns and categorize things. And so we look at those relationships between places so that we can talk sometimes in different chunks. So for example, what I'm talking about are different scales. So here we're looking at the entire world, right? Kind of that global scale. We could though zoom in and we could look at a region. I'm going to come back to Northern Europe later about talking about how Northern Europe is awesome in a lot of different demographics. We could hone in on just the United States, which we're going to do. So we're looking at a national scale. Or for example, we were just talking about Florida, right? We're kind of more of a local scale. And we could even dig even deeper into those different levels. If this is an area where you tend to struggle talking about scale, which many students do, I really hope that you tune in on April 26th when my partner, Ms. Neuroth, is going to talk about scale analysis skills. And she's really going to dig into how do we define, identify, describe, and use those skills. 
Notice we're transitioning to big idea number two. So once we've identified that pattern, right, we want to look at the relationship of cause and effect, okay? So how do geographers use maps, right, those patterns, to discover patterns of the world around them? Well, first, we need to look at our tools, okay? One of our first tools is looking at a reference map, taking a look at where, taking a look at how to get someplace, um, taking a look at different toponyms, looking at, um, can we tell that imprint of who has been there? You know, I grew up in Wisconsin and you're going to find a lot of, along that Mississippi River, you're going to find um, St. Croix, La Crosse, you're going to find um, markers, right? Those toponyms that reflect French set, early French settlement. We also could look at different thematic maps. I mean, who doesn't love a good chloroplast map? I mean, we just looked at a bunch. I love them. Here, we're looking at world population um, by countries. And so even if you couldn't read the key, which I would hope that we would, could pause and look at the key, you could tell by looking for those trends of look at India and China. Okay, they're really dark in, in color. They probably have a higher population. And so pulling all of that information together um, using the tool, and then why did that happen? And what's the impact of it? And so later on, we're going to spend more time taking a look. We're going to dig into what are some impacts of some of that heavy population in different areas. We also look for some trends, right? So we use maps to help us discover those patterns. Um, and there's different types of spatial patterns. And so our curriculum really kind of focuses on a few different categories. Your teachers might have used some other terms, which are totally appropriate. But what we're talking about is that type of distance. So if we're talking for patterns, we might talk how far it is between point A and point B. We might, which would be absolute, we could have an exact distance. We might talk relative in relation to an other location. Directions are really important. You better get your mind mental maps ready, right? To be able to think kind of north, south, east, west, what are those regions? Um, I'm going to come back to clustering, dispersed, how spread out our areas, that elevation above sea level, below sea level. What we talk about then are what are those impacts? So here I'm highlighting clustering. So kind of how are things clumped together? How close are they together? And when I take a look, I would look for where do I find those patterns? So I could look at, look at the East Coast, take a look at Southeast Florida, take a look at parts of California. I'm going to start on those spots first. Okay. We see heavy um, people per square mile. So it's clustered, lots of people in those locations. So then if we start to look at that cause effect, right? So the effect is going to be they're clustered. The cause, these were our entry points, right? Right. Today, we've got maybe some new entry points, but we have some continued entry points. Um, and then if I really dig in and I look for other trends, I could start to find probably some major cities. I can clearly see Minneapolis and St. Paul. I can see Milwaukee. I can see Chicago. I can see Detroit. So I can see these cities. Take a look at Texas. I know you guys are out there. How many cities can you spy based off of density, right? But that's where the jobs are. That's we look for the pattern. We look for, we can see an effect here. We see what it is. And then we try to, why, why do we see so many people there? Go back to that why of the where. We also help us to kind of look at, dive in for sometimes even bigger patterns, right? So here we're looking at the rate of natural increase. So how is that calculated again? We're looking at crude birth rate um, and we subtract crude death rate, and that gives us our rate of natural increase. So then we look at, oh, we have some areas with negative um, population growth. We have some areas that are higher in population growth. Can you identify those areas? So that would be our first part, right? Then the second part, so the patterns, that would be that big idea one, but then that impact and interaction. So the impact here, we'd start to look at, okay, why, why is this happening? So Eastern Europe, take a look at Russia, take a look at, um, at Poland, um, Ukraine, Belarus. So a lot of those areas, right, had been heavily impacted um, economically after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so we see some of the 
the remains of a post-industrial deindustrialization happening in those areas. And so we see people having less kids, which then is going to impact your a rate of natural increase. We also know if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, where we see our higher rate of natural increase, typically very um, agrarian, and that's typically going to cause a lot of places to have more kids, right? For some supports. And we could look at some cultural trends, which we are going to in other videos as well later on. Now, I want to be careful we're making some overgeneralizations. So you got to always look at the questions and they're very nuanced. So pay attention to the next eight videos because we're going to really start digging into those um, questions and how nuanced they might be. So if we go back with our rate of natural increase, and I mentioned that idea of taking a look at sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and we see higher crude birth rates, we could look at sometimes the impact of maybe education on um, fertility. So if we look at the big idea here, here's a question. How does the interplay of economic, cultural, and political factors influences changes in a population? So we want to make sure we're always reading our titles. We're understanding what's being happening on our maps, our charts, our graphs. So if I take a look, we've got women's educational attainment versus fertility. We've got um, children per women, and then we also have average years of schooling of women in reproductive age. So unfortunately, in my class, we do talk quite a bit about Niger um, because they tend to struggle in a lot of demographic um, categories. And one of the things what we really look at is we're seeing high, right, over seven, an average of over seven children per woman and low education right? Less than two years of education um, for women in their reproductive age. So we start to identify that. When we get to big idea three, we're going to talk about some of the societal impacts. Right now, what we want to look at is kind of kind of that why. So some of this could be patriarchal society. Some of it could be access to health care. Some of it could be cost of education. It could be people needing to work um, and so we, we need more help. It could be life expectancy. So right now we're kind of just brainstorming what are a lot of those different reasons, right, that they, they might be in that, that area, right? Then if we take a look at the other end of the spectrum, you'll see the United States. We're going to see South Korea. And so what we would find is that higher education could and typically does lead to less children per women. Okay. And so we talk about on the flip side, access to all of those other things, right? To healthcare, to um, preventative care, to longer life expectancies, to different economies, not needing as many kids to work in the field. So then what, right? And what we're really going to start to dig into when we get into the next one, the societal impacts, okay? We're going to get a little more nuanced than just identifying. So hang on. Remember, right now, where that impacts, that cause and effect. So we could also look at it within agriculture, right? Why does what people produce and consume vary at different locations? So obviously, we have to look at climate, right? Climate's a major indicator of the type of crops that we're going to be able to grow. But take a look at who's doing the work here. We have a female doing the work. And take a look what's in the background. Do you see that terrace farming? So some of that is going to be, this is um, what access to the different types of crops, and then also what the land is able to hold that possibilism, right? We're building out our, those areas. There's also those parts of this that also are going to be connected to cultural. So if we look at this kind of cultural practices, so share of agricultural landowners who are female, and so we look for some of those trends of who actually is owning the land. So if we look at Northern Africa um, and Southwest Asia, we're going to see very few women um, are going to have a share of agricultural land, of owning that land, right? Well, why is that? Well, a lot of that is going to have to do with a patriarchal society, right? And so who can actually own it? It's going to be impacted that the men are the ones that are going to inherit and own that land. When we go to look at Southeast Asia, one of the things that we'll notice is that we're starting to see more women actually becoming landowners. Remember, 
when we take a look in the background there, the rice, and obviously she looks like she's doing a pretty labor intensive um, uh, job as well. We need lots of people to harvest, to plant. Remember, these are intensive crops in this area. And so really all hands on deck. And so you're going to see more women kind of um, owning land in those areas because of necessity and who's doing the work. We also know when we look at places such as Northern Europe, the United States, States, Canada, Canada. We're going to look in our next big um, idea. We're going to look at gender equity, and we're going to find that those regions are going to be a lot more equitable than some of the other regions. So we're shifting. You're hanging there. We're making it through. We're into big idea three. So spatial process and societal change. Okay. So when we read this earlier, when it talks about and its environmental consequences. We're definitely going to take a look at land, but we're also going to talk about environment as far as culture as well and some of those societal consequences that we have from the ideas that we were just talking about. So how do we analyze, you know, geographers use spatial perspective to analyze these complex relationships, issues and relationships. One of the things to think about is we got to, things are nuanced. So the first thing is we talk about the world in terms of regions, right? So we can continue to break them down. So these are world regions according to the World Bank, right? You've got North America, we have Latin America and the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not going to read them all to you. But even within those regions, you heard me talking about, if we look at Europe and Central Asia, you heard me talking about Eastern Europe versus Northern Europe that there's nuances. And so really your job when you go to write later on is to really kind of reflect on those nuances as well. Here's a good example of that, what I mean by that. So it's complex, right? So if I'm looking at this um, electoral votes from 2016 and I look at the United States, so kind of looking at this um, overall, and then I start to dive in a little bit, I see a lot of red. And then I dive in, if I'm looking at Arizona, I see, okay, they their 11 electoral votes went to the Republican Party. But remember I said it's nuanced, right? And so those societal changes, um, and we look at those spatial processes, if I really dive into this, take a look. I mean, four counties actually um, had more Democrats winning their votes. And my guess is, is if we dig into some of those other red counties, there are individuals that voted um, that voted for some Democrats as well. So why do we point this out? Well, we point it out because we want to look at the why, what's going on in some of these areas. So we know there's been a change in retirement patterns moving to New Mexico and Arizona, right? So do they bring some different ideas with them? Could I look at different cities that might be located in some of these blue zones? What type of workers are located in those areas as well? Um, why might they have a different voting pattern than other counties? So that's when we talk about understanding um, spatial process and societal change, it's really kind of digging into sometimes those nuances, right? That it's complex, that we don't just overgeneralize. We start there and then we want to dig. So here's another good example using some data, right? So here, here we're looking at industrialization, um, help to improve living standards, um, but it also created some geographic unevenness, right? So if you take a look at the countries on the left, we can see different GNI. Um, and then what we dive into is we really look at the impact on that, the human development index. So remember, a lot of times with the gross national income, it's money that we can also spend then, right, on healthcare, on education. Um, we can um, really look at how do we make sure that people in our our countries, right, have access to those resources. Typically, what we find is that the higher these, this human development index, um, we find a higher gender inequality index or a lower gender, gender inequality index. We want to be low on that. We want to find, we want to get, if we can get to zero, it means we're, we're equal, right? Men and, males and females are equal. And so part of that is a lot because go back to human development index, we're spending money on education and educating everyone. So let's see what that looks like in some maps. And this is getting at this. We start, go back to patterns. What pattern do we see here? So big idea one, take a look at North America, take a look at Australia, take a look at Northern Europe, right? 
So we're seeing, look at Japan, we're seeing areas, right, with high human development index, which I told you we can spend money then, right, to on education, on those opportunities. Then what we see is on the flip side, right, is we start diving into the gender inequality index, is we start to see those same areas that have high development index are going to have, we're getting really close to gender equity, right? That zero where males and females are equal in terms of pay, in terms of, we could look at land ownership, we could look at it in terms of empowerment um, in those management positions. And so that's when we start to look at those societal changes. Where do we see the patterns and what could bring about some of those changes? Why does why has industrialization helped improve standards of living while also contributing to geographically uneven development? So we were just looking at that, right? And so what we look at is sometimes the changes in the types of jobs that we're asking people to do. So we're going to go back to where we saw women kind of working in the fields, right? Look, Take a look at Southeast Asia. And so we start to see people moving to some of those middle management positions, but not at the same level when we take a look at the United States, when we look at Europe. So why is that? Well, we know that more people are engaged in agriculture and not industry. And so when we start seeing more and more people moving to the city and taking on those those industrial type jobs, and we start transitioning to more tertiary type um, economic systems, so more service systems, we start to empower people to take on those different roles. What you're probably sitting here thinking is, this is complicated. And she really connected a lot of different concepts throughout all those different units. Yeah, that's what we really start to look at. So when we teach you guys during the year, we spend a lot of time in our in our units. But the reality is our questions, our lives are more entwined, just like those big ideas. So that's really what we're going to do, right? Is we need to then look at how are they entwined. But I know you guys, you want to practice some questions. So what, Mrs. Brandt, would this look like on a test? So we're going to look at a few multiple choice and we'll look at a few FRQ. So I think about patterns and spatial organization. So in my head, when I see golf courses and I read that word lush, okay, lush, I think green, I think luxurious, right? In um, the UAE, uh, we've got dikes and polders in the Netherlands. We've got the Three Gorges Dam in China. So these examples reflect which of the following viewpoints of human environment interaction. So in my head, I tried to picture all of those different locations and what's happening, or at least one. Why are they able to do all three of those things? When I look at the terms to um, the choices, I hope you were able to come up with possibilism right? That without those things, if we didn't have irrigation systems in place, we wouldn't have golf courses at, in the UAE. If we didn't have polders and dikes in the Netherlands, we wouldn't have as much farmland because we need to be able to, right, drain that area. And in China with Three Gorges Dam, we wouldn't have a lot of things. But if we think about travel, if we think about electricity, that those these big projects were all made possible because of human um, innovation, capitalism. Okay, big idea one, production of agricultural products destined primarily for direct consumption by the producer rather than for market is called. So there's always a few of these where this is really feels more like, Mrs. Brandt, this is vocabulary. Absolutely. But one of the things that we want you to think about here is also what patterns might you see. So hopefully you quickly in your head pulled up subsistence agriculture. But remember, this is the starting point. Where would I find subsistence agriculture located? Why there? Who might be doing the work? What are some positives? What are some negatives? Is this sustainable? So Having those bigger questions, this is our starting point, the bigger questions then lead us towards those being able to explain and connect at a higher level. So for example, shifting cultivation is an example of subsistence agriculture, correct? But we're not going to ask you just to define it. Now we want you to describe it. Okay, So we have a map of where it's located. 
But now what does shifting cultivation look like? What do we mean by shifting? What do we mean by cultivation? So if I were you, feel free to pause. See if you can come up with, I'm going to give you a hint. There's three big things we'd be looking for. Could you come up with these three? Could you come up with the practice? The first thing is we have to clear the land. A lot of times we talk about slash and burn. Then they're going to farm the land for a few years until that land is no, uh, not able to produce um, your goods anymore. And then when that happens, we move, we shift, right? Um, to another plot of land. And then we start the process all over again. So in order to receive points on this on an FRQ, you would did all three of those when you were describing shifting cultivation. Okay, so big idea too, what might that look like? So remember we talked early on, these are our tools. So I talked about different types of maps, but there's other tools too, right? Map projections. Um, so every map projection has some degree of distortion because. So you pause. I'm going to pretend you're reading. Hopefully you came up with a curved surface cannot be represented on a flat surface without distortion, right? So that seems like a right there question. Well, what you want to be able to do later on, if we're talking about impact, right? Why? Why? And what are those interactions? So you could talk about, I'm sure your teachers talked about um, Mercator maps that, um, that captains of ships really like Mercator maps. Those straight lines really help to provide guidance um, it, for sea travel. But the other thing, if I talk about impact, um, there were some countries that also liked that projection too. If you remember how big it made places such as Russia or Canada by really distorting their land, um, their land mass at the poles. And so that's that kind of that impact, like perceived power based off of size. So understanding the concept and then what's the impact. So this is infant mortality map. You're going to see this in many of our videos because it's pretty nuanced. I'm not going to lie. I'm just fascinated because I think it just tells us so much about areas. So we see high infant mortality rates in particular, go back to patterns, our pattern. We see sub-Saharan Africa. We could say also a little bit of South Asia, a little bit of Southwest Asia, but really kind of focusing in on this is where our highest infant mortality rates are. But take a look at what this one was asking you to do. Describe two economic reasons for the level of infant mortality rates in Western Europe. Okay, well, what are the infant mortality rates in Western Europe? Oh, really low, okay, compared to other areas. So economic reasons why they're low. So we're going to describe two economic reasons for the level of infant mortality rates in Western Europe. And you probably looked at this and like, this is Brandt, how am I supposed to read all this? See that pause button? I would recommend that you pause this and read through them. So I'm going to pretend that you just paused. So I'm going to only just highlight a couple of these. Um, the first one, higher standard of living. So in Western Europe, we know that they have a higher standard of living. Okay, don't just stop there. What does that mean? Well, that higher standard of living means that we have greater access to consistent and sufficient healthy foods. We can buy um, the fruits, the vegetables, um, maybe sometimes for the mom. Remember, this is from birth to one year of life. And so when we talk about mom getting really good calories and nutrition, that she's able to pass that on to her child. Um, provide for better set better sanitation and hygiene. Just think about even access to water and clean water and how important that is. That birth to one year, you know, if you're someone that uses formula, using clean water to help um, provide that for your child is going to be really important. So that higher standard of living provides some of that access. We also could look, I mean, let's just be honest, let's talk about education, right? Education improves, but we need to make those connections. So Education reduces um, adolescent fertility. Well, what do we mean by that? In other words, teenagers, typically, the more education you have, you're not having kids as uh, teens because you're taking longer to go through school and education becomes that focus. Um, we also know that in education, and so you're not going to see as infants dying. We also, more knowledge about childcare and nutrition. A lot of our schools really focus on your health classes, your 
Um, we have a child development class where those teachers are really teaching you how to care for children and appropriate nutrition for them. Again, that's going to improve infant mortality rates. And then women have fewer children, which then leads to better infant and child health. And so part is because I'm prolonging having kids, I'm probably going to have fewer, which is also then we know is going to decrease infant mortality rates. So kind of constantly bringing it full circle. So let's look um, at another multiple. We'll finish up here with big idea number three. I've got a couple multiple choice questions and, and a couple FRQs. So hang in there with me. So you're going to say, Mrs. Brandt, we didn't talk about mega stores. It's okay. You've got this. So what is a mega store? I always think of like our big box stores, right? Um, so there's a lot of arguments. There's a lot of critics of big box stores. So you're going to see a lot of arguments here, but what you're not going to see, so what you're trying to pick out is what's not one of those arguments. Okay. So big box store. I feel like everywhere I go, I see them. No matter what city I am in, no matter where I travel, I can usually find some of those. Well, if you think like that, you should end up then that mega stores do not, this idea that conform to a distinctive region, that that's not, so conform to distinctiveness of a region. It's not helping make us unique. It is that homogenize the landscape. So the cultural landscape all looks the same. That's what those mega stores are doing. So why do we do this? Well, because we know if we look at number A, destroying locally owned businesses, we know that it's kind of, there's these outsiders with no stake in the community, that's a societal change. And so understanding the impact that sometimes these big stores have on an area. So I kind of just went through some negatives. Could we do some positives? Could you talk about bringing um, new business, bringing more revenue, um, increasing um more buyers into uh, the area. And so not only are they going to the big store, but maybe they're going to the mom and pop store. So really trying to think of both sides, which we're going to talk about all over these next uh, eight videos, continuing to look at those pros and cons, multiple perspectives, making sure we're, we're looking at many different angles. So here's another one. So this we did kind of indirectly talk about. So industrial production in less developed countries often relies on female labor. So why would countries rely on female labor? So take a second, look through those. What do you know about female labor throughout the world? They don't have to pay women as much. We look at historically these patriarchal societies where we know that uh, wages for women are much lower than men. We noticed when we looked at that gender gender inequality index, we started to see um, that really that that equity was not as strong in some of these LDC countries. And this is one of those indicators that they're just not paid as well. So we can even dive into here. What's what one way, let's look at uh, which way, sorry, describe one way in which the roles of women in the paid labor force of developed countries change as a result of the transition to a post-industrial economy. If you're like my students, they kind of fumbled the way that I just did. And they're like, what is this question asking? Well, what we're asking is, is that how does a role of women in developed countries, how does it change when we move out of industrialization? What do we see changing? So first you have to think, what was it like in industrialization? Who's, women were probably working in factories, right? Women were probably, um, we see kind of that, that shift of where they're, they're working there. And so when we're transitioning out of that, where are they going? Well, let's look. So we start to see more women moving into the service sector. Okay. And so when we'll talk about tertiary type um, jobs, but we start, they're going to shift into that service sector. We see gr uh, greater gender equality in the workforce because they're going to transition into that. They have some experience and we start to see more leadership and management positions. And then we also start to see women working towards reducing that pay gap, that if we're doing the same job, shouldn't we be paid the same? And so giving that voice and really the start of it started in industrialization and it's really going to propel them through that post-industrial um, into our post-industrial economy where women are going to demand those, those same opportunities as men. Wow. We did a ton today. 
And so what we really, what I want to make sure we're taking away is that these big ideas are not in isolation. They're found in every single unit and every single skill that we're going to touch on over the next, now we're down to seven videos. And as we do that, I want you really to kind of think about how does everything fit together? What are those connections? I hope you join us tomorrow where we start diving into those skills. Ms. Neuroth is going to get you going and you're going to see what are some of those big ideas really um, entrenched and connected with those skills. I hope you had a great time with me and I hope you join us again as we continue down this journey the next couple of weeks. Thank you.